staple. <laughs> it's a staple now. Okay, I don't know. Let's get through this quickly, guys, as quickly as we can. All right, so we've been uh, joined by Council Members Traeger, Williams, Finance Treasurer Lisa Ferreras Copeland, Carlos Menchaca, Donovan Richards, and Robert Cornegy. So good afternoon to everybody. Um, the City Council uh, will begin today by voting on the reappointment of Dr. Robert Cohen to the Board of Correction and on a mu multiple land use items, including the rezoning of Lower Concourse North in the South Bronx. As a representing council member for this project, I can first speak firsthand to the serious time and effort that has gone into developing plans to turn the concourse into a major hub for the surrounding community. I really credit the land use team for their work with our district office, community board four, local advocates, and interested developers on getting this project moving forward and implementing the modifications that will ensure this becomes a community asset for generations, including the siting of a new, approximately 570 seat school at 639 St. Adams Avenue. At present, the remainder of the project is slated to include 600 units of affordable housing, with 70% of units at or below 80% AMI in phase one. Community facility space to house the Universal Hip Hop Museum and local nonprofit Bronx Works. And around, <laughs> I know, I hear the mumbling. <laughs> and around 2.6 acres of open space, including a waterfront esplanade, an extension of Mill Pond Park, and a public plaza along Exterior Street. The council will also be considering resolution 1675 of 2017 today, authorizing myself, the speaker, to file or join amicus briefs on behalf of the city council in litigation, challenging the rescission and modification of the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals Program, also known as DACA. As the future of dreamers across the nation have been repeatedly attacked, we at the City Council have made it clear that we stand with undocumented immigrants throughout the city and throughout the United States as they seek a legal means to remain in the country and that we will continue to do so at whatever level becomes necessary going forward. I'm joined by Committee on Immigration Chair Carlos Menchaca and invite him to weigh in on the necessity of this resolution in empowering the council to stand up for its local communities. Carlos. Thank you. And when I started this, everyone, yesterday we took a major step forward in challenging any and all modifications or rescissions to the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. This is something that we've been committed to as a city council and the speaker being the loudest voice, making sure that we are at the table in this discussion. We wanna ensure that our friends and neighbors and in any and all cases, our families stay in this country to continue to pursue their dreams. Dreamers deserve that opportunity to preserve, to pursue the American dream without fear of discrimination, without fear of deportation. For this reason, we, are in the, we at the Immigration Committee yesterday voted out this pre-considered resolution to empower the speaker to speak on behalf of us as city council members and every soul here in New York City to testify in support of DREAMers on any legal briefs. We will also use every legal tool available to us to protect DACA recipients. We will protest. We will do whatever it takes to protect the immigrants of our city and the United States at large. DREAMers, you have our voice. Thank you. Okay, on the legislative side, the council will be voting on intro 1720A, sponsored by Recovery and Resiliency Chair Mark Traeger, which would establish a Hurricane Sandy Recovery Task Force to analyze the recovery efforts in New York City in response to Hurricane Sandy and make specific recommendations for preparing the city for future recovery efforts. Uh, council Member Traeger. Thank you, Speaker. Every October, Hurricane Sandy gets heaps of coverage, and then just like that, those impacted by the storm are forgotten. My bill requiring the creation of a Hurricane Sandy Recovery Task Force will make sure our Sandy survivors don't slip through the cracks as they continue to rebuild. It's not hyperbole to say that the recovery process has been just as bad as the storm. 
As we approach the five-year anniversary of Hurricane Sandy, we have to make sure the city is doing more to help the many, many people who are still rebuilding. My bill would require the Hurricane Sandy Recovery Task Force to provide a report on the recovery efforts by city agencies and provide apt recommendations to help our city prepare for future natural disasters. We need to make sure we understand the recovery process from, in, from the inside out, and my bill will ensure that our city has a holistic account of the successes and failures of recovery so far, and will create a better blu a blueprint for responding to and recovering from those natural disasters, both for our city and for others. Thank you again, Thank Speaker. You, Introduction 1517A, sponsored by Governmental Operations Chair Ben Kalos, would amend the date on which candidate financial disclosure reports are due to 25 days after the last day for filing a designating or independent nominating petition. It would similarly provide a 25-day filing period for write-in candidates in primary elections and a 20-day filing period for candidates designated to fill a vacancy. Um, Councilmember Kalos was unable to join us today, but we thank him for his work on his bill. Our first legislative package for today continues building upon our previous work to improve construction site safety standards. Introduction 1404A, sponsored by Housing and Buildings Chair Jamani Williams, would increase the minimum civil penalties and fines for violations of the, state, of the site safety provisions of the New York City Buildings Code and the Administrative Code of the City of New York. Intro 1429A, sponsored by Councilmember Julissa Ferreras Copeland, would require that workers at construction sites that require a site safety manager, site safety coordinator, or a construction superintendent receive pre-shift instructions, including a discussion of safety concerns regarding the tasks and activities to be performed during that shift. Introduction 1444A, sponsored by Councilmember Mark Traeger, uh, would expand the requirement and uh, that workers at construction sites that require a site safety manager, site safety coordinator, or a construction superintendent receive site-specific safety orientations and periodic refreshers to all construction sites. And intro 1437A, sponsored uh, by Councilmember Carlos Menchaca, which would double the civil penalties for construction sites with excessive violations. And I would ask uh, these three colleagues to, actually four colleagues, to come and speak on their bills. Why don't we start off with Councilmember Williams, chair of the committee. Thank you, Madam Speaker, um, and thank you for your leadership on this. Uh, 14, uh, well, this package, just in general, I want to make sure people understand. We said from the beginning, obviously, there was a lot of focus on 1447, uh, <coughs> but this council has been working on so much when it comes uh, to construction site safety. We had a package of, I believe it was 21 or 22 bills, uh, the largest ever heard uh, with this body. So while we were focusing on one bill, uh, we made sure to tell everyone that's not the be-all, not the end-all. We're going to continue working. Uh, my bill in particular, 1404A, is a key part of the Construction Safety Act package and an important supplement to other pieces passed, such as 1447C, uh, which was signed yesterday, co-sponsored by my colleague, Councilmember Menchaca. Enforcement through in increases, uh, minimum civil penalties, fines for sa site safety violations. Immediately hazardous violations will double from $1,000 to $2,000. Major violations increase from a no established minimum at all to $1,000. Too often, builders view the penalties for code violations as simply the cost of doing business. Uh, it helped erode uh, the culture of safety that was spoken about for so long. That mindset puts the public and construction workers at great risk and obviously can't continue. These bills would ramp up punishment for builders at sites that have a history of thwarting the laws designed to keep us safe, particularly those particularly where those violations result in death or injury. Unfortunately, we got a report today that uh, I believe five more uh, construction workers uh, were injured. I understand one is in, in critical. That was in my colleague, Councilmember Cornegie's district. And so we understand uh, even as we're doing, we have to continue to do more. Like much of the Construction Safety Act, it goes beyond the specific outcome of the legislation and becomes a part of changing the eroded culture of safety in the construction industry. Uh, this will bring when this package uh, hopefully voted on pass, it will bring the package uh, from of 21, 11 of those bills would have been passed. Uh, again, it's not about one bill. Uh, we are focused on this. Uh, I thank my colleagues uh, who co-sponsored on this package, Councilman Ferreras Copeland and Menchaca, and in particular, I thank uh, the speaker and the entire body for really taking uh, this issue by the horns and moving it forward. And I'll have some thank yous uh, at the Thanks, end. Thanks, Councilman. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, for your support of 1429A, and thank you, Councilmember Jamali Williams, Chair of the Committee on Housing and Buildings, for holding the hearings on this bill. Um, as was mentioned earlier, over the last few years, our city has experienced a surge in construction worker death. Now more than ever, guaranteeing the safety of construction workers is top priority for this council, and I think um, through the leadership of our speaker, we have proven that. Today, we will be passing a bill that will require mandatory safety meetings before any kind of construction or demolition work is set to begin. The safety meetings will include a discussion with workers of safety concerns related to the task and activities to be performed during that shift. With this legislation, we want to ensure that every worker has the information needed to remain safe at the workplace. Um, some of the things that we've heard is a work site <coughs> can change at any given moment related to weather or conditions or even something that happened overnight. And I think this is the most prudent way to make sure that everybody on the site is aware of any changes. Thank right. you. Councilmember Traeger. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Speaker. We've made uh, tremendous strides in the council, thanks to the Speaker's leadership and of course my colleague, Chair Williams of the Housing uh, Committee, to make sure our construction workers have better protections in place to keep them safe on the job. Uh, but construction workers still face enormous risks every single day. Safety standards aren't one size fits all and different sites have different risks. My bill will require site specific safety orientations for workers at construction sites so workers are aware of unique risks they face at each particular site. There will also be a periodic safety review at all construction sites. It's crucial to make sure that all of our workers in our city are protected and I'm proud that my legislation will help make our city safer. Thank you, Speaker, for your support. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Speaker and Chair Williams. The leadership here has been pretty clear and we're not done yet. Today's bills really are gonna impact not just the education and awareness through 1447, but clearly more on my bill, 1437A, that allows for us to double the fines. We know that money uh, talks in this industry and so we wanna make sure that we are committed to ensuring that people are not gonna get away with in the in the, in the uh, excessive violations world, we see so many of this in patterns for some of our construction companies. And so we're ready to do that. And this bill is gonna do that. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. We've been joined by Council Member Brad Lander. So moving on, introductions 1509A, 1510A, and 1511A, sponsored by Small Business Chair Robert Cornegie, would require the Commissioner of Small Business Services to post on the city's website, online business tools and resources, including accounting, record keeping, and bookkeeping service. The package would also require the Commissioner of SBS to prepare and disseminate a state of small business survey by September 2018 and to create a comprehensive workforce development plan based to the extent practicable on the results of that survey. Again, uh, this is from the Small Business Committee and our cha its chair is Robert Cornegie. And I'll take you away. Thank you, Madam Speaker. For the past four years, I've had the privilege of serving as chair of the co Council's Committee on Small Business. In that time, I've had the opportunity to interface with various stakeholders who help make the city's small business ecosystem what it is. The staff of city agencies that have a hand in regulating small business and of the agencies that provide our small businesses much needed services. Nonprofit organizations who specialize in microfinance to help small business owners access capital. Technical assistants and technical innovators who provide business owners with unique new resources to collaborate and to communicate to get ahead. And most importantly, I've had the opportunity to speak with the men and women who own and operate small businesses that give our neighborhoods the flavor and character that make them unique. We know that there's a need for training programs for small business workers to fill existing small business jobs. Intros 1510 and 1511 will allow us to quantify this need and ensure that we're connecting potential employees with the training they need in order to save small business owners time and money on having to train workers themselves. Intro 1509 will provide small business owners with access to the free online business tools so they have access to resources that will support their growth and allow them to better comply with the law. My hope is not only that these in initiatives provide the climate for small business in the city and maximize the job opportunities for those seeking employment, but also that they complement the administration's ongoing efforts to reorient the city's workforce development system away from simply job placement and more towards long-term long career track. I'd love to thank, as always, the speaker who is uh, uh, out front uh, and a small business champion, my colleagues in the council who have joined me as sponsors of these bills, former committee counsel Nicola Bean, current counsel Sylvester Yavana, 
polit policy analyst Michael Kurtz and my staff for all their work in getting these bills to the floor today. Thank you. Thank you. On affordable housing and HPD reporting, the council will be voting on introduction 336A, sponsored by council member Brad Lander, which would require the Department of Housing, Preservation and Development to report on the amount and location of affordable housing provided through its inclusionary housing program. The report would also include certain information about the affordable housing, such as the amount and type of government financial assistance provided. We will also be voting on intro 942A, sponsored by Council Member Idanis Rodriguez, which would require HPD to provide housing development project information in a non-proprietary format that permits automated processing. Additionally, this legislation requires HPD to report to the Council on the completion dates location, developer information, and the source, type, and value of all city financial assistance and other financial assistance provided by the city for housing development projects. And finally, intro 1645A, sponsored by Council Member Donovan Richards, which would require HPD to annually report on contributions to the Affordable Housing Fund. Start off with Council Member Lander, then Idanis, and then uh, Donovan. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This council's come a long way around the issues of inclusionary zoning in New York City. The council's first authorized the R10 inclusionary program in the 1980s. We came back in 2006 and created the designated areas program. Uh, and then, of course, in uh, this term, expanded through the mandatory inclusionary housing program. A challenge with all of it, though, is that it has not been easy to get clear, transparent reporting, both for knowing on each individual site what's actually required and for in the aggregate looking at how much housing has been created at what depths of incomes um, across these different programs. When my office did a report in 2013 trying to evaluate the success of the designated areas program, we essentially had to compile it project by project by project just to see how it was working, uh, how many developments within a particular rezoning area had used the program, et cetera. So we were able to work together with uh, HPD and the administration and uh, the council staff on a good bill that will give us one nice portal with a map, real easy to figure out project by project and in the aggregate uh, what has been created through the inclusionary zoning program. So we will be able to make better public policy going forward and so residents and neighbors will be able to enforce the rules on particular projects <coughs> as well. Thanks very much to the speaker and everybody for helping. Thank you very much. Idani? Thank you, speaker. Uh, you know, one more time to show you your leadership and when it comes especially to affordable housing. There's no way of how the city can achieve our goal of being the number of affordable housing unit without working with the private developers. So we welcome and we will continue working with uh, the private developers. However, many, as many of them are good developers, as it happens everywhere, we will always have the bad apple. And we believe that we have been in many situations in the past where some developers has not provide all the information that they should. With this bill that, with the support of the speaker, my colleague, the chairman of the housing committee, Jamali Williams, we will be passing today. It will bring transpar the transparency that the New York is a taxpayer dollar deserve to know who are those developers, to know what program those developers are part of, and how, when will those projects be completed. Thank you. Thank you. I'm proud uh, to stand here today as we continue our work on ensuring that the mandatory inclusionary housing program achieves the goal of facilitating the development of much needed affordable housing. And while the in lieu payment was included in the final plan to secure affordable housing funds when developers seek financial hardship, we want the ability to keep track of any developer who has a pattern of resorting to this option. Intro 1645A will help achieve that with yearly online reports organized by borough and community districts. When we lose out on affordable units during development, it's our obligation to ensure that the money is used in the communities and boroughs that it was meant for. Ultimately, this bill is about transparency. It's about keeping the public informed with online tracking of the investments in their community. Every decision we make to address the affordable housing crisis must be focused on building stronger communities and the best communities are informed ones. I'd like to thank our speaker, Land Use Council Jeff Campagna, and my legislative director, Jordan Gibbons, for his work on this. Thank you. Awesome.
All right, on legislation to enhance Department of Homeless Services reporting and practices, the council will be voting on intro 622A, sponsored by council member Elizabeth Crowley, which would require DHS to provide information to all new recipients of shelter uh, on domestic violence. And introduction 1460A, sponsored by general welfare chair Steve Levin, which would repeal provisions of the administrati uh, administration code enacted by local law 51 of 1993 in regards to establishing an advisory board and interagency coordinating council and replace it with a section creating a continuum of care steering committee responsible for advising DHS on the implementation of the Federal Homeless Emergency Assistance and Rapid Transition to Housing Act of 2009. Council members Crowley and Levin could not join us today, but in light of the serious state of homelessness in our city and given that we are in the middle of National Domestic Violence Awareness Month, I really want to thank them for this timely legislation. And the council will end today by voting on intro 1313A, sponsored by council member Julissa Ferreras Copeland, which would expand chapter eight of title 20 of the code, the Earned Sick Time Act, which would be renamed the Earned Sick and Safe Time Act, and which would be expanded to allow victims of family offense matters to use earned safe hours in connection with overcoming such abuse. Uh, this is obviously a very sensitive and important issue to be tackling. I really want to commend Councilmember Ferreras Copeland for addressing a reality that faces both women and men throughout the city every day, and we'll ask her to say a few words. Thank you again, Madam Speaker. First, um, I'd like to also acknowledge uh, Mayor de Blasio, who has been a very strong supporter on this part and a partner um, through this proposal, and Councilmember Danique Miller, who chaired the Committee on Civil Service and Labor, for holding a hearing and co-sponsoring this bill. As we hear more and more outrageous allegations of sexual misconduct against well-known and powerful figures in our country, here in New York City, we will, we will continue to fight for the safety and well-being of victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, and human trafficking. Domestic violence is a problem that has a great impact on our families, our communities, and in our city. Women who experience physical violence from an intimate partner report an average of 7.2 days of lost work related in a productive year. We want to make sure that survivors are able to use their paid leave from work to attend to immediate safety needs without fearing that they will be penalized or lose income. That is why we are expanding the Earned Sick Time Act, which will now, uh, um, which from now on will be referred to as mentioned by the speaker as the Earned Sick and Safety Act. Survivors will be able to use up to five days as paid safe leave um, seek medical to seek medical help, file an order of protection, meet with law enforcement, relocate, enroll the child in a new school, or um, access other related services. Um, oftentimes, it's not just about calling 911. It's all the times and all the meetings that you have to go after that first call um, that makes um, all the difference. So thank you, Madam Speaker. And I'm very eager and proud of our colleagues for supporting this legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Julissa. And very, very briefly, just quickly on two, a couple of things in Spanish. Eh, buenas tardes, hoy el Consejo comenzará votando sobre la resonificación del Lower Concourse North en el sur del Bronx, en mi distrito, y sobre la reelección del Dr. Robert Cohen a la Junta de Corrección. Por otra parte, también votaremos sobre una resolución para autorizar a la Presidenta del Consejo Municipal a presentar o unirse a escritos amicus que desafían cualquier cambio en el estado, actua en el estado actual del programa Acción Diferida o DACA. Y por último, el Consejo presentará a votación un proyecto de ley que permite ampliar la ley del tiempo de, de enfermedad ganado para permitir que familiares de víctimas de delitos como la mala conducta sexual, el contacto forzoso, el abuso sexual o, la, o violencia doméstica, eh, que puedan usar horas seguras de trabajo para acompañar a su familiar durante el proceso de superación. And with that, I answer questions. Questions, questions, and questions are all Yeah. 
So I don't, I have not looked at that at all. So I would have to definitely talk to the staff and see uh, whether there was any engagement with us, whether there is any oversight or overview or uh, uh, engagement that we have to be involved in. So let me, let me defer, let me get back to you on those items. It's obviously I've been extremely <laughs> preoccupied with other matters and that one just kind of slipped by me. So I, I, I kind of heard something vaguely today, but I don't know the details. No, I just no, no, not on, not on the, not at all. And uh, in terms of whether or not we were informed uh, before today, I, that's what I'll find out. So I'll get more details for you on that. But I, I don't really know much about it at this moment. there or we can always get to the uh, chair of the housing and buildings committee but as we've said all of this package of bills has been something we've been discussing for a while and we've been, been engaging all stakeholders uh, just because a particular stakeholder doesn't like the direction the bill is going in uh, they, they can't be dismissive of a process that actually has been inclusive so uh, I think they're not being real uh, a little bit disingenuous on that front so more than willing to hear their concerns but we we are very proud of the package of bills that we've been discussing that we've been engaging in to make construction sites safer. This is about saving lives of not only the workers, but also the surrounding uh, individuals, you know, people that walk by these construction sites, people that live in the surrounding area. Uh, so this is very important, and I'm so glad that we were able to tackle it under my leadership. I'm sorry? Yeah, we, we, there's been hearings. There, have been, there has been individual engagement outside of the hearings. Meetings have been held. It's been known for some time. The bills that we have been discussing, so any feedback was more than welcome. They are definitely sophisticated individuals. They can provide us with any concerns in writing. Uh, so there was plenty of, no, uh, of, of, of time to discuss it. Not only was it, what the, was it the hearing itself, but there were conversations and there was obviously knowledge that we were engaging in this conversation before the hearing was held. So to say that this was something, you know, fly by night is ridiculous at this point. So um, we, again, have engaged in a very thorough process. I believe it's about being able to yeah. apply the time that you have yeah. for this purpose. So we'll, but we'll get you the details. Right. So it's time that you've earned. Yeah, it's time that you've earned. The same rules, um, same uh, policy or rules apply, um, and it's just expanding the definition mm -hmm. for which you can take this time. Right. And not just for sick time. Right. Yes. Not right. Not five additional days. That it can be applied towards this cause, you know, this issue. We are. We had a hearing, and I, I've been very clear uh, that I'm very proud of the mo almost two-year dialogue that I engaged in with my community uh, that resulted in the East Harlem Neighborhood Plan, which has a whole host of recommendations on many, many issues, not only housing, but open space, classroom sizes or classroom spaces. Um, so I'm using that as, as a guide for me, and I've been very clear that I want the rezoning to really take seriously into account the recommendations that have been made. Now, there's always voices of opposition to any rezoning. I plan to have additional engagement and conversations in my neighborhood about this issue, but we did have a community conversation in two, over two years, uh, and there clearly there's always gonna be those that just don't want a, any rezoning to happen. I, I don't think that's the wisest move at this point considering the affordability crisis that we have. So uh, we're, you know, we will engage more. I see it, and I, as I indicated at the hearing, what we heard on the day of the hearing 
was not the application that was originally presented to the community board. It was the, what the community board voted on is not what the borough president voted on. There have been adjustments along the way. That's part of the evolution of a land use process. So I am taking into consideration the feedback and I'm continuing to push and negotiate with the administration that I would like the East Harlem Neighborhood Plan recommendations to be taken very seriously in this process. I have to, no, I, I have to see progress made. I'm at, what was presented to me at the hearing does not satisfy me at the moment. So I need to see adjustments and changes. Well, um, prior to being finance chair, I was chair of women's issues. So I like to think that that's the path. Yeah. Um, but the reality is I've been engaged in these conversations for a very, very long time, um, nine years now, if not more. And we found that oftentimes women would miss appointments with either a DA or miss appointments at the police precinct, or unfortunately in, in cases had to go and serve um, orders of protection and they had to go themselves and weren't able to do that because they couldn't take the time off work. Um, so this is something that you know we've been working on for some time and it was the appropriate time because we're also working in tandem with the mayor um, and the Office of Domestic Violence and the speaker. So I'm just very happy to be able to vote on this today. It's this wherever the paid sick time is applicable, that is where this will also apply. Uh, conversations are happening on that bill still, so that's where we're at, and we should, you know, we'll, we'll keep giving you updates as, as they're available, but we are having conversations with the sponsors of the bills. What bill is it affecting? What? Yeah. We're having conversations uh, with the sponsors of the bill on the bill, and we are determining what path we're going to take. But it's only affecting what we're not going to do anything. We're... Uh, that's an internal, that's uh, conversations we're having internally on whether or not we're satisfied with the way that the administrative changes are being implemented. Well, that's factoring in our conversations. Well, thank you so much. Thank you.